introducing this counting function n of x, we managed, after a series of manipulation, to write this, this object for large n in the form of a functional integral over counting functions that are positive, or at least non-negative, and normalized one of uh, exponential of minus beta n square into a certain energy functional plus subleading orders that we are able to ignore. And due to the, due to the long range um, structure of the interactions between particles, uh, this uh, factor here is not n as in standard short range models, which means that the free energy of this gas is not extensive as, as we are typically used to, uh, to see, but it is super extensive. So it goes as n square, not just n. In particular, the entropic contribution to the free energy is subleading for large n. So the entropy is always extensive, but the energetic component of, of the free energy is super extensive. So we can neglect all the, all the, other, the other terms and concentrate on, on, this, on this object here. So the, the functional here, I gave it to you yesterday. It is just given by nx x squared minus one half double integral dx dx prime nx and x prime log of x minus x prime. So the, the form of this functional integral lends itself to a very nice saddle point approximation for large n. So all we have to do now is to find the stationary profiles n star of x which minimize this, this functional. And in order to do this, we need to, to find the solution of the formal solution of this stationarity condition, which is this, this equation here. Now, performing the uh, variation with respect to a certain profile n of x of this, of this functional here, we are basically led to the following equation. So let me explain it. So this, this term here is due to the functional differentiation of the first integral. This term here is due to the functional differentiation of, of this integral, taking into account that when we differentiate over nx as a function, we, we've got two functions here that are multiplied together. So we need to first differentiate one of this and then differentiate the other one, which gives rise to a factor 2 overall. That's why here in front you don't have a factor 1 half. Okay. And then there is a, a mysterious constant appearing uh, here. And uh, the source of this mysterious constant is due to this uh, constraint here. Okay. So remember that we need, we need to look for a, for a solution of uh, the optimal density profile, which is normalized to one, okay? So we can, we can enforce this, this constraint by simply multiplying this object here by a delta function that enforces the constraint. Then we can exponentiate 
this, this delta function. And if we put this extra exponential in, in the action, the whole result after differentiation is to introduce another constant here. So this constant must be fixed, fixed in order uh, in, in order to enforce the fact that n star must be normalized to 1. Okay. Good. So, now we can forget the problem uh, this equation came, came from, and we just need to solve this, this equation. So, what, what kind of equation is this? If you, if you, if you were to define it to a, to a mathematician, yeah, so this, this one is an integral equation because the, the function that we want to, to determine is inside the integrand. So this is the unknown that we want to determine in such a way that this equation is, is satisfied. So now the technical challenge is how to, how to extract, how to find out a function that when integrated over a logarithmic kernel will reproduce just a quadratic behavior plus, plus a constant. Okay? Of course, now I put like uh, a suffix uh, omega or, or w here because due to the fact that the range is up to omega, this function will be a parametric, parametrically dependent on, on omega as well. So it will be a function of x and of the location of the barrier. So if the barrier is at omega, we will have a function of x, but also a function of, of the barrier. Because if the barrier is here, the profile will change. Is that clear? Good. Now, uh, the way to solve uh, so in the uh, mathematics uh, literature, this type of uh, of equation of integral equation is known as Karleman Karleman's equations, and there is a standard technique to to solve this type of uh, of equation. The standard techniques is, well, first of all, we make an observation on the behavior of this object for large negative x, okay? So the question, the claim that I'm making now is that n star omega of x cannot have unbounded support. What do I mean by, by this? Remember, we will have a barrier at omega, and we argued that most probably something will happen here. We will have an accumulation of charges at the barrier. But the question is, what's, what's happening for large negative x? Can, can this function have an unbounded support, meaning can, can it extend all the way to minus infinity? Now, the claim is that this is not possible. It is not possible because if you, if you send x to minus infinity here, in, in this equation, then this object here will basically behave as log of x, right? So if you take this out here, log of x, this object here will be equal to 1, the remaining object, because the density is normalized. So you will see that there is no way you can ever balance an x square and the log x behavior. So if your density has an unbounded support, then this integral equation will not be satisfied. Which means that we expect that there should be a cutoff here. So your density should have, should have a lower edge, as much as we know the semicircle has a lower edge. Okay? So we, we expect that the density profile should have something like a behavior like this, but it will not extend beyond a certain cutoff. OK. So the, the idea 
to solve this, this equation is first to differentiate, differentiate it with respect to x. Okay? So you, if you differentiate this equation with respect to x, you need to be uh, extremely careful from the mathematical point of view because here we have a non-analytic point a non-analytic dependence on, on x. We have a logarithm of the absolute value of x. So there is a, there is a formal procedure to make sense of the derivative of this object with respect to x. It is in the notes, in the notes and it, it is the notion of weak, weak derivative. It is just a technical point if you are really picky on, on, on math. In the end, the final result is basically what you, what you expect. So you differentiate here, and you obtain an x. And then you formally differentiate this integral, as you would do normally. So you would have an omega star x prime. And then here, you would have a 1 over x minus x prime, right? The constant here will give a derivative equal to 0. But then you see that there is, there is a problem here, because when x prime becomes equal to x, you might have a non-integrable point here. Okay? You might have a logarithmic di divergence at, at x. So how do you cure this logarithmic divergence? You take the Cauchy principal, principal part. So there is, there is a formal mathematical way to, to go from, this, from the derivative of this logarithm to the Cauchy principal part, and it is in the notes. Okay? But now, I don't think there's any, any reason to spend more time, more time on this. This is finally the uh, equation that you need to solve. This equation will be uh, equivalent to, to this one. And now, why, why is this uh, trick uh, uh, interesting? Because this type of singular this is a singular integral equation because it contains Cauchy singular value. The nice, the nice thing is that we have an explicit inversion formula for this, this type of integral equation. So there is a formula giving the value of this function as a function of the known potential here. You see, we, we get the term x here because we started from uh, a Gaussian uh, model. Suppose that we started from a model characterized by a generic potential v of x. So what, what we'll, we will have here? <coughs> Something like the, the first derivative of, of the potential, okay? Probably with a factor one half. Okay? So this, this, uh, this, in, this class, this object here will be uh, the same for all models, the, this principal value integral, but this object will be model dependent. So if we start from another random matrix model, which is invariant, characterized by another potential, here we will have the first derivative of that potential. Okay? Good. So um, the, the inversion formula for this type of singular integral equation is due to... Uh, an Italian mathematician, whose name is Tricomi, who, whose theorem is, if you have a singular integral equation of this form, principal part between a1 and a2, dx prime, rho x prime, divided by x minus x prime, okay? Then rho of lambda is equal to 1 over pi root a2 minus lambda, lambda minus a1, into a certain constant minus principal 
value integral of dt over pi root a2 minus t t minus a1 over lambda minus t times g of t where c naught is a constant So we have a singular integral equation. This is rho and this is g. And the final formula gives rho as a function of g. Okay. So all you have to do to solve this, this integral uh, equation is to set here, instead of g, g of t, you just replace it with t. Yeah. Excellent, excellent observation, except that it will not. But your observation is very, uh, is very good. So you see, here we have that probably the support of our density, the upper edge of the support will be omega. And we are sort of fine with, the, with this formula. But the lower edge of the support, we know that it will be finite, but we don't know where it is, right? So what, what we really have to do is to solve this integral equation from a certain lower support up to omega, or if you want, up to a certain value a2, which in the end will turn out to be, to be omega. And then we will have to find a way to fix this, this a1. Right. So, so you see, in this type of integral equation uh, problems, the, the support of the density is another unknown on top of the density itself. So in some sense, the, the edges of the support of the density arises as, as a phoenix from, from the ashes of, of this integral equation. So not, not only you need to find the density, but you need also to fix the support of it. And how do you fix the, the support of it in the end? Well, remember that this equation came from a minimization problem of, of basically this, this function. So what, what you have to do is you solve this, this equation for generic A1 and A2, for example, and then you plug the result back into the, the, en the energy functional, and then you minimize the energy functional with respect to a1 and a2. That fixes the. So in some sense, the solution of, of this integral equation is not in one-to-one in, in -one correspondence with the minimization problem we started from. Okay? The classes of solution, uh, the class of solutions of this integral equation is much wider than the one we need. Okay? We only need one representative from that class, the one that minimizes the, the energy function. Okay, so all you have to do now is a lot or a bit or a lot of algebra, just replacing t here, performing this, this integral. Well, it is a long, long exercise, but not particularly, uh, you know, uh, appealing. And I can just give you the, the result. which is n star of lambda is 1 over 8 pi root of a2 minus lambda, lambda minus a1. So I consider that the upper, the upper edge is a2, just, just to, to leave it completely general. And then this is the result, 8 plus a2 minus a1 square plus 4 a2 plus a1 lambda minus 8 lambda square. 
So this object here is the general solution of the integral equation, of the singular integral equation we had before with edges A1 and A2. Okay? You can, you can check, just take this function, plug it in here, compute the integral, and you'll find x. Okay, so what, what you have to do now, well, what you have to do is to plug this object into the energy functional. So the energy functional was So, you, you plug this formula into this integral and into this integral. You just solve the two integrals. Of course, this minus infinity here will be truncated at A1, right? And so, this, this object, once you have computed the integral, will be just a function of A1, A2, and omega. Right? Because you are, you are just computing the, the integral, so the x dependence will, will be washed out. What remains is the dependence on a2 and a, and a1, which are the edge point of, of, your, of your support. And then what you do is you minimize this, uh, this function with respect to a1 and a2. So you find a way for your density to be supported exactly on the support that minimizes the energy function. So is the, is the procedure clear? You know, I've skipped several steps, but uh, at least in, in, in essence, the steps should be, should be, should be clear. Okay. Good. So all you have to do is a series of, of integrals and a minimization, minimization property. If you do that, well, first of all, you get you get the once you have minimized this this function with respect to a1 and a2, well, then you can go back here and and replace the values of a1 and a2 that you found. So the optimal density has this this shape. If omega is larger than A2, you obtain that A1 equal to minus A2 equal to minus root 2, and the density has the shape that we expect. Okay. So if, if the barrier is larger than the upper edge, A2, then the upper edge becomes equal to root 2, and the lower edge becomes equal to minus root 2, and the shape in between is the semicircle, which is the situation that we expect, because the, the barrier is, is ineffective. So the, the, the gas stays in the, in the same configuration where it would stay as if the, uh, the, the wall was, was not there at all. But when the wall is inside the C, then the profile gets modified, and we get a non-trivial result. The non-trivial result, well, I just give it to you. Omega is a non-trivial function. So, 
So you see that indeed, as we expect, we have a square root divergence of the spectral density at the position of the wall. So our density really looks like this. It has a square root divergence, so an integrable divergence here at the position of the wall, because all the charges are accumulating there. They would like, they would like to hop over, if they could, to reconstruct the semicircle, but they can't, because they are forced to stay to the left of this impenetrable, impenetrable wall. <coughs> If uh, omega is equal to root, uh, if omega is equal to, to root two, then we then the two exp expression becomes equal, and and so we are exactly at at the at the marginal situation where the semicircular is, is reconstructed from both sides sides. So the the problem is in essence uh, solved. All you have to do now is to plug this expression back into the energy functional, and this energy functional will be basically the free energy of your, of your problem, right? Because it's, we, we know that the original integral goes as exponential minus beta n square into this object evaluated at the subtle point. So rare deviations of the largest eigenvalue to the left are described by a large deviation uh, function, which is nothing but this functional evaluated on this, on this object. It is just a matter of computing two integrals. Okay. Good. So all, all this, this derivation in full with, with all details is in the, in the notes that I, that I will scan. And uh, I also ask uh, Erika to upload a couple of uh, papers, like some review papers, where they basically um, redo this, this derivation in full from, from top to bottom. So you should be able, in principle, to reconstruct all the, all the missing steps. If there are things that are, that are not, non, not clear, just drop me an email, and we'll try to sort it out. Okay. If the number of emails get extensive, then I will give you my Skype, then my phone number, then my home number. Okay? Then you can organize individual meeting, tutorials, stuff like this. Okay? All free of charge, just for you. Good. Okay, so this was, uh, in essence, uh, one application of the Coulomb gas technique for a specific for a specific problem. Now I wanted to change, as I, as I promised, uh, to change completely the, the setting completely and discuss uh, a new branch of uh, mathematics, which I find particularly uh, appealing, and its connection to, to random, random matrices. Uh, so as, as you see, I'm, I'm trying to give you some tools and techniques some general tools and techniques to, to tackle problems that you, you might and you will get in your, in your professional life, okay? So the, the tool that I'm describing now is, um, well, it's, it's something that I would, I would have liked, I would have loved to invent myself. It's another one of the various things that, that people have done before me. And it's called, it has a fancy, fancy name. So, free probability. Okay, so I will descri describe uh, the, the, the problem in, uh, again, in very simple, simple terms and, and see what this construction, why this construction of free probability allows us to, to solve it, at least in some special cases. So the problem is as follows. You have two matrices, A and B. Let's say they are N by N, and 
well, they are uh, Hermitian, but the, the problem can be formulated in more, in more general terms. It's, this is just to set the stage, okay? So the, the problem that we have is we want to find the uh, eigenvalues, so A and B are not random, so they are, for the moment, fixed matrices. So the problem is to find the eigenvalues of the sum of A plus B. Okay. Now, this is a linear, linear algebra uh, problem, and w we know that already at this stage the problem is extremely complicated, right? Why? Because to know the eigenvalues of A plus B, it is not sufficient to know the eigenvalues of A and the eigenvalues of B, right? So the ingredients that you need are the eigenvalues of A, the eigenvalues of B, and the relative position of the eigenspaces. Because if the matrices A and B don't commute, they cannot be simultaneously diagonalized. So you need to know how the eigenspace of the second matrix are oriented with respect to the eigenspaces of the, of the first one. So in order to, to solve this problem, we need to, to have much more information than we would like to. We would like to solve this problem by saying, well, we know the eigenvalues of A, know the eigenvalues of B, then we are done. This is not the case, okay? Now, um, what, what if we want to circumvent this problem and we want to define an operation Let's call it a non-standard addition. Of matrices. That depend. Only on the eigenvalues of individual matrices and not on the relative position of the eigenvectors. Now this, this seems like a crazy idea, but what we can do, and this is where random matrices come into, into play, is we can define uh, a sum, let's, let's define it like, like this, with a, with a plus inside a box, A plus B. And we define it in this way. U dagger A U plus V dagger B V. Where U and V are random unitary matrices, let's say, drawn uh, uniformly from the unitary group. So let's, let's think about, uh, about it for, for a second. What, what we are doing here? We are taking the first matrix and we are randomizing its eigenvectors. We are taking a second matrix and we are randomizing the eigenvectors. And then we are summing the two. So we are obtaining now a random matrix because one specific instance of this, this ensemble depends on which U and V you picked, okay? So this object is not, this is not a deterministic object. This A plus B is a random matrix. But the good thing is that we have washed out completely the information about the eigenvectors because we have randomly rotated, we have randomly shuffled them, okay? So the information that prevented us from, from computing the sum of the eigenvalues before, which was the relative orientation of the eigenspaces. Now we have reshuffled the, the system completely, 
And at the, price, at the price of introducing randomness into the game, we now have a hope of performing this, this summation, and that this summation only depends on the eigenvalues, and no longer on the eigenvectors. You see? Is the, is the general philosophy sort of clear? Okay. Good. Now, of course, uh, we uh, originally the matrices A and B were fixed, were deterministic, but we can, we can redo the same, the same procedure in principle with A and B random themselves. So they, are, they might be random themselves, and we randomize the eigenvectors. Yeah? So, uh, so you and B, uh, and B are choose one set forever uh, as, say, one for the definition of this uh, new uh, operation? Or they are choose, every time I do an operation, uh, I sum to matrices, I draw a random uh, U and B. So, so if your A and B are, are fixed, then you, you draw the first U. So imagine that uh, I, uh, now I want to uh, say I have A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. I want to do A plus B plus C. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I will have uh, uh, the same operation, which is the plus. Yeah, you uh, can. Uh, how, uh, how should I define it? Uh, with the same U and B? I mean, when the sum uh, A plus B with C, should I define it with the same U and B, or should I define it uh, with a different? Uh well, but but how how does this uh, uh, make a difference if 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 you are averaging over the the unitary group? Well, I mean, U U and V are 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 fixed in the sense of, uh, you know, you, you pick an instance of u and an instance of v, and you get an instance of a plus b. So this, is, this will be one random instance of the sum. Okay. So, so you, you pick a, a sample, a first sample, so a first unitary matrix, and you, and you do this, plus a first sample of v. Right? So, so this, this, is, this will be one sample of a unitary matrix drawn from the unitary group. And so you get a matrix C, first sample. Okay. Then you redo, the, you redo the, this uh, operation. Uh, sorry, this is B. With, with, a second, with a second draw from the unitary group and you obtain a second sample. So, so if you have on the, on the left, uh, uh, then uh, A plus B is not a matrix. Uh, it's, it's, it's an instance of a random matrix. So really the of matrix. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, so the, 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 whole, the whole point is that now you have a probability distribution on these matrices C, <coughs> which is induced from the probability distribution that you have on, on U and V. Right, so all these elements, all this matrix here will be different from this matrix here, but they will have some statistical property. So and then uh, when you do A plus B plus C, you choose uh, uh, two other matrices as well. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So the philosophy is that in this case, for the typical case, typical choice, you would have made the two eigenspaces. Uh, no, no. You, you will, you will have, uh, you will have made the two. Uh, the, the, I mean, the two eigenspace. Your, your, there will be an angle between the two, the two eigenspace. But it will, in the end, it will not matter which angle this is. While if you are summing two deterministic matrices without doing this reshuffling, there will be an angle between the two. But it matters which angle this is. But are you integrating over the angle? No, no, you're not integrating. You're, you're, what you are, uh, in the end, the goal of, of this uh, process is to show that in the limit n to infinity, the density of eigenvalues of this uh, probabilistic, of this random object, 
can be determined only knowing the density of eigenvalues of A and the density of eigenvalues of B. So you don't need to do know any information about the, their relative eigenspaces. But the, so the, the price to pay is that you are introducing randomness in the system, so you are talking about density of eigenvalues, not a precise correspondence be, between the first eigenvalue of the sum and the first eigenvalue of each of the two individual sum ones. But the, 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 the advantage is that you have washed out completely any dependence on the relative positions of the eigenspaces. Okay? So, and this brings us to the concept of freeness. So freeness, uh, wh when I first learned about it, I thought that it was a, an excellent and brilliant idea. And I'm still convinced about it. So freeness. Freeness is the, we can define it as the generalization of the, concepts, of the concept of independence between random, variable, random variables for non-commutative objects. So you see, when, when we think about random variables, we, we, never, we never think typically about whether they commute or not. Right? So if we take two random variables, two standard random variables, x and y, then we assume that x times y and y times x give the same result, right? But this is, of course, not true for, for, for matrices. So the notion of freeness generalizes the concept of independence between random, random uh, variables for non-commutative uh, objects. So we are injecting this extra ingredient into the game, into the probability theory game, of whether they commute or not. So freeness is defined for random matrices. Of course, it is, it is a larger concept, so it applies more generally than to random matrices. But specialized to random matrices, it means that freeness is the combination of three ingredients. Um, the three ingredients are uh, n to infinity. So it is very, very hard to define freeness for finite n, the size of the matrices. Freeness is an intrinsically infinite dimensional concept. Then we have that A and B are statistically independent, and this is expected. So the matrices, the, the way you sample the entries of your matrices A and B should be in a statistically independent way. So the entries of one should not know anything about the entries of the, of the other, and this is, this is expected in some sense. So you don't want to have built-in correlations from, from, from the start. But the third, the third ingredient is the fact that eigenvectors are in generic position. So the, the precise way the eigenvectors of A and the eigenvectors of B are, are located uh, is not important, should not play a role. And one way to achieve this is by this randomizing operation. Now, if, if, if this was just a definition or a, or a fancy way of describing a new type of probability theory, then we, we wouldn't care. But the problem, the, the, the point is that, sorry? You mean the mathematical definition? Well, that's, it's a bit more complicated. But it's, 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 a, it's essentially a, a condition on the independence of certain combination of trace moments of the sum. Okay? But in essence, it, it boils down to these three, three properties. Now, if, if two matrices are asymptotically free, then we can apply a theory that gives us the spectral density 
of this object here in terms of the spectral density of A and the spectral density of B without any reference to eigenvectors. Now, what is the, what is this, this theory? <laughs> let's, let's draw a parallel to the uh, standard, standard probability. So in standard probability, you have an object, uh, so in classical or commutative probability, you have that if you have like random variables that are independent and are drawn from certain PDFs, P of xi of x, and we construct the sum of these random variables. Yeah? This means that you have washed out by uniformly randomizing the eigenvectors any information about what the real eigenvectors of your matrix are. Okay? So your matrix will have some, some eigenvectors, but, but by combining it with random, random matrices drawn from the unitary group, you are performing random rotations. You know? And then you are summing the randomly rotated versions of, of, your, of your matrices, and you obtain a, a matrix that is not deterministic, it is a random matrix, because for each choice of your randomly, random rotation matrices, you will get an, a different mm, sum. But the problem is that this one will create an ensemble of random matrices, and we're interested in the eigenvalues of, of it. Okay? Good. So, if you have the sum of independent random variables, there is an object that we, we can use to compute the statistical properties of the sum, which is there's Matteo there. Well, I just Recognize this object? OK. So this is the characteristic function. So if we are summing standard uh, random variables, um, <coughs> we know that the characteristic function of the sum would be the product of the characteristic function functions of the summons, right? And if we take the log of the characteristic function, so we define g of xi of t as the log of phi of xi of t, then this relation becomes additive. So g of st is g of x1 of t plus, plus g of xl of t. So this object here is the generating function of the characteristic function is the generating function of of moments, right? The the log of it is the generating function of cumulants. Okay. So this is, this is just a crash, uh, the, sorry, crash course on classical probability. Okay. 
if you have the sum of classical random variables. Okay? Now, what happens in the context of free random matrices? Can we, can we, can we draw a dictionary between the two, the two fields? Can we find some, some objects that behave in the same way for random matrices? Then the, the answer is yes. So the and the the main object in the game is what we have already um, seen uh, at the beginning of the of the course. You remember this object, which is called? OK, so it is called either resolvent or for, uh, for some funny reason, uh, it is nicer to talk about the Green's function in this context. And I will explain you why in a, in a second. Okay? So let's call it the green, Green's function. Why is this uh, object important? Well, we can rewrite it as lambda rho A of lambda divided by <coughs> Z minus lambda. Good. So now there is a, a very interesting paper that I also uh, produced, reproduced in the, um, in the handbook by Tony Z, uh, law of addition. in random matrix theory. And he's a very funny guy. So what he, he wrote in, in the paper is, for the sake of convenience, we may with due respect to green, somewhat fancifully define a blues function. Okay, so we have the greens function, this object here, and now we define the blue, the blues function. Okay, and <laughs> the the situation now is taking a, a turn that is almost surreal because now we have papers with titles like Fifty Shades of Blue." <laughs> <laughs> so the situation has has gone slightly out of out of hand. So what is the blues function? The blues function is defined very simply. It is the functional inverse of the Green's function. So you have GA computed in BA of Z is equal to BA computed in GA of Z and is equal to Z. Okay? So the definition of the blues function is just the functional inverse of the Green's function. And remarkably, the blues function satisfies the free addition rule. So the blues function of the sum of L free matrices is equal to B H one Z plus B H two Z plus B H L Z plus one minus L over Z. Uh, 
No, this one, this one is a standard summation. So, so these are, these are some, this, this standard summation between complex functions. So this H1, HL are random matrices for, which are summed according to the sum operation. Or alternatively, they are random matrices that are rotational invariant. Okay. The two, the two things basically uh, coincide just because matrices that are rotational invariant are, have their eigenvectors already washed out. Mm -hmm. So this uh, this operation here that I'm mm, can can be also uh, okay. This this term here might be a bit a bit disturbing because there is this. So what we can do is we can define the R function as the B B the blues function minus one over Z. So this is called the R function. And in terms of the R function, the R function is strictly additive. So the, the R function is for, yeah? So, so there is, so if, let me, let me write it here. There is a, a, a theorem which is basically a sufficient condition for freeness is let uh, n by n uh, random matrices an and bn such that an and bn have an asymptotic eigenvalue density for n to infinity. This is just technical, we don't care. An and bn are independent, meaning that the joint distribution of the entries of A and the entries of B factorizes into the joint distribution of the entries of A times the joint distribution of the entries of B. And BN is a unitary invariant, so a rotational invariant ensemble. Okay, so at least, at least one of the two is a unitary invariant, is, is drawn from a unitary invariant ensemble. Then uh, AN and BN are asymptotically free. Okay, so we can use AN plus BN in the same way as we would use AN plus BN. So th these two things are interchangeable. So they, they produce an ensemble, the, the ensemble sum has the same statistical properties in the two, in the two cases. Okay. So you see that the R transform here as the same property for random matrices that the cumulant generating function has for classical random variables. 
right? So it is, it is additive. So what is the what is the usefulness of the R transform, for example? And then I will give you an example. Oops. So the the R transform uh, is the generating function, as, as the cumulant generating function is the generating function of cumulants for standard random variables, the R transform is the generating function of objects that are called free cumulants. Okay? So it is a complex function that you can expand in a, in a series. So R, for example, property 1, R of Z can be written as summation n1 to infinity k n z to the n minus 1, where k n are called free cumulants. N to infinity, N to infinity is is in here. The fact that the eigenvectors don't matter is in, is basically inside here because one of the ensemble is unitarily invariant, so the eigenvalues don't don't matter there, right? Because the the statistical weight is unchanged if you perform any rotation. Okay. And the third element was. Independence, right? The fact that the matrix, the, the, the first matrix and the second matrix are not trivially correlated through their entries. This is obvious, right? If, if you sample the entries of the first matrix in, in a way that is correlated with the entries of the second one, then you are breaking the freeness just from the very, very beginning, right? This, this is a sufficient condition, it's not a necessary condition. But if, if this happens, then automatically the standard sum reproduces an ensemble that is exactly equivalent to the, to the ensemble that you would get taking a free sum. Okay? Good. Now, the concept of uh, free cumulants uh, is uh, a bit... Uh, complicated, but we can use uh, the, in, the same intuition we have in classical probability to try to find a, a, a way uh, to assign a meaning to these objects. Okay? So for example, in classical probability, if you take a Gaussian PDF, like a standard Gaussian, What are the, the cumulants of a standard of a standard Gaussian? The classical cumulants. The, <laughs> the, the, the cumulants, please. The cumulants of a Gaussian. Like okay. The, sorry. So the, the, first, the first cumulants are identical to the moments. So at least, OK. The first moment, yeah, which is zero. Okay. Second moment, yeah, well, the second cumulants would be equal to the second moment if, if the first moment is zero. And it is equal to one. And all the other cumulants, three, four, five, zero. OK. So all cumulants are. are zero, except the second, the second classical cumulant, which is not the same object as this one, which is equal to one. Okay. 
Now, we, could, we, we can ask the, the question, what is the, uh, <clears throat> if, if, we, if we ask that the second, cum the second free cumulant is equal to one and all the other are, are zero, what is the corresponding, what is the corresponding R of Z and what ensemble does it correspond to? Okay. Sorry? Yes. But now we need, you know, the, the R function is related to the blues function, which is related to the, which is the inverse of the greens function. So from, from this chain of, of connections, we may, uh, you know, go back and find out what the greens function corresponding to, to this R, R function is. And so we will have some information about the ensemble that is analog to the Gaussian in classical probability, right? You see the, the logical series of, of steps. Okay, so we want the uh, second cumulant to be equal to one, so R of Z is equal to Z. And now we need to know what relation exists between the R function and the Green's function. Well, we know that the Blue's function is the functional inverse of the Green's function. So it means that if we compute the R function with an argument, using as an argument the Green's function, we have So, this equation and the definition of the R function implies this relation here, which implies that G A of Z is equal to 1 over Z minus R A G A of Z. This is the, the fundamental relation between the Green's function of a given ensemble and its R transform. Now, people who, who are expert of quantum field uh, theory might recognize something in, in, in this. Are there experts in quantum field theory? Just skip this. No, I'll tell you. So, this looks very much like a first Dyson Schwinger equation in quantum field theory, where here you would typically have what is called the self-energy contribution. If you haven't heard of any of these, just, just forget it. I'm just flashing it for for the expert. There is actually a deep connection between the, the two things, but you have, if you haven't heard of it, don't worry. Okay, so all we have to do, this is a general relation, and now we apply this general relation to the uh, R function, which is exactly equal to Z. Okay? Second free cumulant equal to one, and all the others equal to zero. So the equation that we have, if R of Z is equal to Z, this implies 1 over Z minus G A of Z. Do you remember this equation? Well, it's funny because it's the only equation involving the Green's function that we ever, we ever saw. Okay. <clears throat> 
So this gives g a of z equal to one half z minus root z square minus four. And if we apply the Sokotsky Flemish formula, we obtain that rho of lambda is the semicircle. Okay, so we have we have obtained by this this formalism that the semicircle low, the spectral density, the semicircle low plays the same the same role for the addition of random matrices that the standard Gaussian plays for the addition of classical uh, variables. Okay. In particular, the semicircle low is stable upon free addition as much as the Gaussian PDF is stable upon classical addition. So if you, if you sum uh, if you sum classical variables that are all Gaussian distributed, you get a variable that is Gaussian distributed. And if you, if you sum random matrices that have the semicircle as the, the spectral density, you obtain a random matrix that has the semicircle as its spectral density. Okay? So there is, there is some sort of, uh, of interesting parallel. <clears throat> of course, this... Uh, this does not happen uh, in, in general. So in general, you can, you can sum different random matrices, and you will obtain a profile for the density, which is, which is neither of, of, the, uh, of the summons. So what is, what is the algorithm using the R function? What is the algorithm that you can use to compute the spectral density of, of a sum? Yeah, that's 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 true. Uh, although there are uh, the classes of free stable, like of free stable, of stable free lows, is larger. Yes, of course. So, so so you might you might so this argument would not would not work for for other stable for for other free stable distribution. It is consistent. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, uh, I think, well, as, as a curiosity, I think the only, the only law which is stable both in classical probability and in free probability is the Cauchy, is the Cauchy law. So, it is true that if, if you sum Cauchy, classical Cauchy distributed random variables, you get a Cauchy distributed uh, random variable. And also if you sum matrices whose spectral density is Cauchy, you will get a matrix whose spe spectral density is Cauchy. But that's the only one where the two things, it's the only law which is stable in the two cases, which is stable and free. So what you, just to, so suppose that you have like a matrix uh, A1 drawn for, from a certain rotational invariant ensemble, and the matrix A2 drawn from another rotational invariant ensemble, just to consider the simplest, the simplest case, plus maybe A taken from a rotationally invariant ensemble, okay? And, and you sum these matrices producing 
you, you sum every instance of, of this matrices producing an instance of the, mat of the matrix sum. So this matrix will be a random, random matrix. So if, if the matrices are in the limit n to infinity, you can compute the spectral density rho s of lambda from the spectral density of rho of a1, rho of a2, rho of a l. How, how you do that? Well, you know the spectral density of these objects. So from each individual spectral density, you can compute the Green's function, right? So you can compute the Green's function of the first matrix, the Green's function of the second matrix, and the Green's function of the Lth matrix. Okay, this, this is a somehow easy operation because you only need to perform one integration. Okay, from the average spectral density in the limit n to infinity. Then what you do, from the individual Green's function, you can compute the individual Blue's function, which are the functional inverse of the individual uh, functions. So you, com you compute the Blue's function of the first one, the Blue's function of the second one, and the Blue's function of the third one. and of the alpha. one. Now, from each individual blues function, you compute the R transform by simply subtracting 1 minus Z from each of them. So you compute the R transform of the first one and the R transform of the last one. OK? Then what you do, you sum them up. You sum them all up, and you obtain, using the uh, result that I gave you without proof, you obtain the R transform of the sum, which is R of A1 of Z plus, plus R of A L of Z. And now you have already hopped over on the other side, on the side of the sum, right? And now, now you can proceed backwards from the R from the R transform of the sum, you can compute easily the, blue fun the blues function of the sum. From the blues function of the sum, you functionally invert it. So you get the greens function of the sum. And from the greens function of the sum, you, you, work, you work back and you obtain the spectral density of the sum using the Sochotsky Plamage formula. And so the problem, the problem is solved. So just, just to show you how it, uh, it may work in, in practice, uh, in the handout, there is a small uh, mistake. There is a part that is missing, so I will send an updated uh, version, just uh, copied. Um, it, it just got cut out. So in the numerical handout on page 26, I exactly do this, this, this thing numerically for the uh, addition of two random matrices, one GOE and one uh, random matrix, which, is, which belongs to the so-called Wishart, Wishart ensemble. You don't need to know the, uh, the details. So what happens is that the GOE has the semicircle as its spectral density. The Wishart ensemble the Wishart ensemble has a spectral density which is positive, so the, the eigenvalues are all positive, and it looks a bit like this. So I wanted to know what is the spectral density of the sum of a GOE and the Wishart and the Wishart matrix, and I applied this this algorithm. I take the semicircle and this uh, function here. I compute the Green's function. I functionally invert it, compute the R transform, sum them up, and then go back backwards. 
and I obtain numerically, I obtain analytically, the uh, spectral density for, for the sum, which I then compare with numerical simulations. These are given in, uh, in the final page of the, of the handout. So, so you see that the solid curve is the spectral density that you obtain from this, from this algorithm, and the, and the dots are results from numerical simulations, so diagonalization of large, of the sum of large, large matrices. So you see, uh, this, this basically is a hybrid shape. The spectral density comes out as a hybrid shape of the, of the two. So it is a slightly elongated uh, semicircle. Uh, so, yeah. Well, you can, you can, you can see it. But, but the point is that you can compute the spectrum exactly. It, uh, it comes out from, from, from a calculation. So, mm, so why, why is this method uh, interesting? Well, because sometimes in, uh, uh, in, in real life, you might have to compute the spectrum of the sum of, of random matrices or, or of matrices that can be approximated by uh, random matrices, or you might have a ma one matrix you need the spectrum of, which you cannot compute, but you can decompose this matrix as the sum of two simpler, simpler matrices, right? And then maybe you have a chance to compute the spectral density of the original uh, matrix by, com by you know, composing a free addition of the two building blocks that are simpler. So this, uh, this route was actually taken, oh, this route was actually taken in, uh, in a few papers um, that are reproduced in the, uh, in the handouts. So for, for example, on page uh, 40, there is the Edelman, uh, Edelman's group uh, paper who published quite interesting uh, PRL, where for example, they consider the Anderson, Anderson Hamiltonian which is, uh, uh, do we have the handouts uh, with you? So like the, the equation eight is the Anderson Hamiltonian. So you have basically a three diagonal uh, matrix with random elements on the diagonal and uh, hopping terms on, on, the, on the off diagonal. And so what they tried to do is to decompose the Anderson Hamiltonian as the sum of a diagonal part and a hopping, hopping term part with, with zeros on the diagonal. Okay, so this is the decomposition 9A in their, in their paper. So they were like, okay, let's, us, let's suppose that these two matrices are asymptotically free. So we have a diagonal matrix whose spectrum is, is simple, plus a three diagonal but with, with zero on, on the diagonal whose spectrum is also simple. Okay, because all the elements are, are equivalent, so it can be diagonalized use, using Fourier, Fourier modes. And then they applied this, this uh, free addition algorithm, which in principle should not work because there's no reason to believe that the two matrices should be, first of all, they are not rotational invariant because they are sparse. But, okay, let's, we, we don't know what to do, just, just try it. And actually they found that there is a very good agreement between the procedure I described here for the spectral density of the Anderson Hamiltonian and, and the one that is obtained using a free, free convolution of the two spectral density of the diagonal plus hopping, hopping term. This is the figure, figure one in, the, in, this, uh, in, this, in this paper. So although it is, this is not widely known and maybe it will not work in, in general, but it gives an idea of one possible a way to use, use this, this result, when you want to compute the spectrum of a matrix that you don't know what, what to do with, you might try to decompose it as a sum of two matrices that are easier, whose spectrum is easier to compute, and then try to, you know, to apply this, this algorithm to put, to put the two together. Yeah? Um, so this this object here is the average is the average spectral density. So um, this is not a statement on the probability distribution of the eigenvalues, but this is the statement over the spectral density which we have defined in that way, averaged over the over the sum ensemble. 
in the limit n to infinity. And provided that this is the, this is the definition, then it is an exact statement. So we can, we can reconstruct the, spec, the average spectral density in the limit n to infinity of the sum from the average spectral density of, in the limit n to infinity of the sum months with no reference whatsoever to the eigenvectors. Yeah? So can you use this for inference in the sense that, uh, say, imagine that uh, you get uh, some data or a matrix, a correlation matrix, or whatever it is, because this is, uh, comes from uh, a noisy process, noise, yeah. on which uh, you know the spectral density, you know that this is uh, rotational. Yes. Yeah. Break. Yes, yes. It, but unfortunately, it has been done. Okay. So th there are t two uh, two part of your parts of your question. So the f the first one is, um, yeah. So the the first one is suppose that you have. Uh, a correlation, uh, let's say, an empirical correlation correlation matrix, uh, which can be decomposed as the true correlation matrix of your data plus a noise, and and if you assume that your noise is rotational invariant, so if you assume that your noise can be modeled in this uh, in this in this way, okay, then in principle you can use the um, the tools of, of free probability to compute the, um, the, spectral, the spectral density of the, of the sum in terms of the spectral density of the unknown uh, signal and the spectral density of the, of the noise about which you assume to know something. Because you only need to one of them is rotational. Yes, yes, yes. You, because you, are, you, you, can, you can factor out. You, since, since this measure is uniform on the orthogonal group, or unitary group, and the R measure as the composition property, so the product of two R measure uh, is, is, is a R measure matrix, um, you only need one of these. So uh, the second part of your question is, what information can you extract from, from the spectral density? Well, actually, this is not probably the best, uh, the best thing to go and, and look at. You can do much better than this, because you can go and look at the uh, relative position of the eigenvectors between the uh, unknown signal and the uh, empirical correlation. So, for example, can you reconstruct the leading, like the principal component, from the uh, position of the principal component of the empirical matrix? Can you reconstruct the true one from the empirical one? Now. Uh, this, this type of problems ha has, been, uh, has been studied using a combination of free random variables and replica, replica trick uh, by um, Boone, uh, Bouchot, and um, Potters. There is also a, a review on, on this, a uh, recent review on the, um, on the archive, and they they call this uh, like oracle, like oracle estimation, because uh, it seems that in the limit n to infinity, you can uh, any dependence on the unknown things, which is the re the true correlation matrix, basically drops out. So so you can, although in principle this ingredient must be there to say anything. Actually, there is some miracle that happens in the limit n to infinity that any dependence on the true, on the true signal is basically drops out. So you can get basically a universal, uh, some, some, I mean, well, there are some caveats, but, uh, but this, the combination of free probability and replica theory has been used already to address the problem of cleaning correlation matrices in presence of rotational invariant noise. 
um, actually the the uh, okay there is there is something that that could be uh, interesting so how do you prove uh, I, I I gave this result without without proof so how do you prove the uh, the law of addition of for for R transforms so there are essentially three um, three proofs that three ways to prove uh, this one. So one is uh, combinatorial, which is, uh, which is messy. Uh, the second one is using uh, diagrammatics, and it is even, even messier. Uh, the third one uh, is using replicas, uh, and, uh, and this is, uh, this for me is the is really beautiful. It's a really elegant proof uh, of uh, of the law of addition for random matrices using using replicas. You can find it in the appendix of uh, of this paper. And actually, it was so beautiful that I really wanted to uh, to do it uh, for you. Um, so I started reproducing all all the proof. And so there is only a slight problem that there is one step. In, in between that is not completely correct, okay? And I can say it loudly because it has been confirmed to me by one of the authors, okay? So I didn't want to, to give a lecture containing one step that is not correct. So the final result is, is correct, but if you want to fix, so it is not just a typo, it is a bit more complicated than that. So if you want to fix it, uh, the problem becomes a slightly more um, more delicate. Okay? So I just didn't want to. Uh, it, it would uh, it would occupy too much too much time. But the the general philosophy of the proof is is really beautiful. So you can you can go and have have a look at it. But just bear in mind that one one formula in the derivation is not correct as as stated. Okay? And if you look at it for five minutes, you should be able to understand why pretty clearly. So there is something on the left-hand side that cannot be equal to something on the right-hand side. It is pretty obvious. And uh, yeah, and I can say it, although I, I have these three people in the highest esteem, but one of them confirmed that there is an obvious glitch there. Okay. So. So this should. I hope they will. They will fix it in the final, in the final version. But the, the derivation becomes a bit more, um, not so straightforward. And in fact, when I first saw it, I was like, "Wow!" And it's like one-page calculation, and then you get to this beautiful result. But if you try to redo it properly, it's about eight pages. So, so it's uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. So it's even possible. So it, I mean, it's possible to, to make a link with the joint probability in classical, uh, the joint probability distribution in, uh, in classical probability uh, and say that the probability, if, if we look from a quantum point of view, the probability that uh, we have, uh, let's say, we have two observables. Mm -hmm. So the probability that we have. Uh, So, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I got exactly the, the whole point of the question. I mean, the, the general answer is there is a theory for uh, free products of random matrices as well as there is for, for free sums. Uh, the free products thing is more complicated for one simple reason, because even if you take two matrices A and B, which individually ha have a real spectrum, in general, it is not true that uh, the product A, A times B will have, will have a real, real spectrum, okay. right? So um, the theory is, is more complicated because it, it needs to, to allow for the possibility of, of having uh, eigenvalues that are complex. 
So, so you want to have a theory. In, instead, in, in, this, uh, in all this setting that I described, all the eigenvalues are real, and uh, sums, sums of real eigenvalues or matrices with real eigenvalues will have real eigenvalues. So, so there, is, there is no problem. But the theory is developed, so you have an S transform instead of an R transform, and you have a different, different uh, law to, com to, to compose the, the, the to, to, to recover. So you will not have a, a simple addition law like, like this. The, the law is, is slightly more complicated. But if you are interested in the theory, I mean, there are like in, in four pages or five pages, you, you have everything. There is actually a review uh, online on, on free products which is up with, with examples, so you, you, immediately, you will immediately understand how the system, how, how the thing uh, works. Uh, it is by Zdzisław uh, Burda. Uh, it is called something like free, uh, free products of, uh, of random matrices, uh, a, review, a short review or something. Mm. If you're interested, I can, I can ask Erika to, to, to give you the exact... Uh, um, so the, the theory is developed also, I, I just used the, the, the addition, the sum uh, case because it, was, it, it is simpler, but, but the theory is, is there. It is developed also for sum and, and products of non-Hermitian matrices, it becomes more and more complicated, but, but you, can, you can deal with, uh, uh, with this type of problems very efficiently now. So it's, uh, by now, it is well established, but it is something that happened in the last, uh, I don't know, five to six years. So it is really, I mean, I just want, I, I don't know, maybe I made a mistake in, in the choice, but I just wanted to, to show you something that might be relevant for your own uh, research, research interests or might, you know, might ring a bell in, in 10 years' time, like when, if you will ever face a problem problem like this, so then you can look, look it up when, when you, just, just to know that it exists. You know, it is not something that, uh, that is normally taught in, in any undergraduate or, or even graduate uh, courses, because it is something really that happened in, in the last five, six, six, six years. So it is good for you to know that there is something out there ready to use if you'll, if you'll ever need it. Okay. So I'm, I'm not sure if Maybe I, I just botched it badly, but I just tried to, to give you this, uh, this, this type of flavor of what people are doing today. Okay? So uh, with this, uh, I think I'm going to conclude. So it was my, it was my privilege to, to teach you this, this course. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, the second part will happen in, in 10 days from... Uh, for now, I'm, I'm jetting off just immediately. Um, and uh, we will deal with sparse random matrices and uh, replicas next uh, in, in two weeks. So to give you a, a couple of example calculations, top to bottom with, with all the factors of pi's and square root of two. Uh, and uh, yeah, then that's it. Oh yeah, that's also the example. Yeah, you can go. <laughs>